sermon for World Communion Sunday is based on the Gospel of Luke, chapter 17, verse 5. I would call your attention this morning, my friends, to the fifth verse of that 17th chapter of the Gospel according to St. Luke, in which it is recorded that his apostles asked of the Lord, increase our faith. Now, I suppose that countless sermons have been inspired by this request. And indeed, I shall add one more to that number today. But I want specifically to consider verse 5 in terms of the broader context in which it occurs within Luke 17. That is, I would like to consider it specifically in light of that which precedes it and what follows it. For, as I shall hope to show... That context is vital to understanding the meaning of this oft-quoted prayer. And very well, the first thing I should like to say is that the request, increase our faith, is a laudable one. It is a very commendable prayer on the part of the apostles, for it demonstrates at the very least that they understood that without faith it is impossible to please God at all, as the scriptures elsewhere say. And certainly, they must have sensed that without faith they had no hope of meeting the demands Christ had just placed on them in verses 3 and 4. Look at those preceding verses. Take heed... To yourselves, Jesus warned them. If your brother sins against you, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in a day, and seven times in a day returns to you saying, I repent, you shall forgive him. Now as Paul would later point out to the citizens at Lystra, The apostles were men with the same nature as you and me. And thus they found forgiveness as hard as you and I do. That is why their request, increase our faith, is a commendable one as far as it goes. For we must give credit to the apostles for knowing and admitting that faith would be needed to be as forgiving as Jesus commanded them in verses 3 and 4. To which request for faith, Jesus replies, If you have faith as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, be pulled up by the roots and be planted in the sea, and it would obey you. Now, I am not a Greek linguistic scholar. But according to those experts I consulted, who are, verse 6 of Luke 17 is an unusual grammatical construction. And perhaps it should be best translated into English this way. If you have faith as a mustard seed, and you do, you can say to this mulberry tree, be pulled up by the roots and be planted in the sea and it would obey you. Now that more nuanced translation is revealing because it communicates the fact that what Jesus is really saying in response to the request for an increase of faith on the part of his apostles is this. All that is required to obey my commands is the tiniest amount of The faith the size of a mustard seed, and you already have that. You already have the faith required to do all that I ask of you. Indeed, to do the seemingly impossible, even including, yes, to forgive your brother. Seven times in a single day, 
for the same offense if necessary. As we have said that the apostles sensed the need for faith was a good thing. It was a laudable thing. But Jesus pointed out to them, you already have the faith required. Which brings us then to verses 7 through 10, which constitute a short parable. And which of you, Jesus said, having a servant plowing or tending sheep, will say to him when he has come in from the field, come at once and sit down to eat. But will he not rather say to him, prepare something for my supper and gird yourself and serve me till I have eaten and drunk and afterward you will eat and drink. Does he thank that servant? Because he did the things that were commanded him. I think not. So likewise you, when you have done all those things which you are commanded, say we are unprofitable servants, we have done what was our duty to do. Now at first glance, if you're reading Luke 17, this little teaching story would seem to be rather out of place. Its meaning is clear enough. But what does it have to do with the immediately preceding verses? Well, let's think about that for just a moment. In this short parable, Jesus is making the rather obvious point that in this world, the responsibility of a servant, the word is really a slave, is to serve his master. His responsibility is to do his duty with no expectation of special commendation or reward, and certainly not with the expectation that if he serves dutifully, that his master owes him something as a consequence, that his obedience makes his master his debtor. No, no. When a servant serves his master in this world, even if, as in this parable, when he does extra duty, when he goes above and beyond, Still, when he has discharged all his responsibilities as a servant, he has done only what was reasonably expected of him. You know, when my children were young, I spent not an insignificant amount of time trying to teach them this rule of life. I spent a lot of time, for instance, pointing out that when my boys mowed the yard, because I told them to mow the yard, that they neither deserved nor should expect to get a special reward, an allowance, let's say, for doing what it was their duty to do. If they mowed the yard while I was at work, even without my asking them, well and good. But in so doing, they had only done what I would already required of them to do. And similarly, the spiritual point of Jesus' story is that as God's servants, the responsibility of his apostles was to do their duty. But if they performed their duty in the very best manner in which they could, if they gave of themselves 110%, as the saying goes, perfect. But even then, all they would have done is what they should have done, and what has always been required of them. The point then is this. If the apostles were to forgive their brother seven times in a single day, surely they have done right. But God owes them nothing as a consequence. For again, in so doing, they would have only done what the law has always required that they do. But let us now ask ourselves another question. What was it about the apostles' request for an increase of faith in verse 5 which elicited this teaching story from Jesus? What is the relationship of verses 7 through 10 to verses 5 and 6? I ask this because, again, on the surface, the parable seems somewhat out of place unrelated to what has preceded it in Luke's narrative. 
Well, to my thinking, Jesus' parable is not out of place at all, but indeed quite to the point. For it is meant on one hand as a warning to his disciples, and on the other to point them to something higher than even the faith they requested. And let me try to explain. Jesus has just told his apostles they already have enough faith to do seemingly impossible things, which the command for the mulberry tree to plant itself in the sea is obviously a hyperbolic symbol. Jesus wasn't speaking literally here, but figuratively. Our Lord was not and is not interested in his disciples commanding trees to uproot themselves and plant themselves in the sea. And as the balance of the New Testament would show, what Jesus said was, of course, quite true. In the exercise of their faith, in the days to come, the disciples would do Many miraculous things in Jesus' name. Just read the book of Acts. It's full of those deeds. They had the required faith. And that being the case, it seems to me that by the inclusion of this parable at this point, and especially in response to their request for an increase of faith, Jesus is warning his disciples ahead of time. Remain humble. To realize that if by faith they do even mighty deeds, for instance, if they do actually obey his command to forgive someone seven times or 70 times seven times, as another gospel writer puts it, Jesus is saying, if you do all that, you've only done what the law mandates you do, and you should not think too highly of yourselves or expect a special reward. No. You have only done your duty, and that for which I gave you the power to accomplish in the first place. It seems to me then that Jesus must have known that his apostles' request for an increase of faith wasn't completely commendable. He must have known that in part at least they were asking for an increase of faith so that by their faithful obedience to his commands, by their law-keeping, by their good works, they could set themselves above others, and especially above their fellow apostles. You remember the Pharisees habitually tried to do that, congratulating themselves on their punctilious observance of the law. Thus Jesus warns his apostles, Don't use faith as the fertilizer for your pride. And by this startling parable, and it is that, in which some have noticed that Jesus seems rather harsh. Read that parable. Our Lord reminds his disciples, you and me, that should by faith we do all that the law demands, We've simply done only what we should have been doing all the time anyway. And therefore, from God's point of view, we remain unprofitable servants. In this sense, our service does not enrich God at all. In this way, I say, in the wake of the disciples' request for an increase of faith, the parable is a reminder of the need for humility. And it was a needed reminder. For as the Gospel of Luke shows, the apostles were always seeking a way to set themselves apart and above each other. They were always jockeying for positions of power and influence amongst the little band of Jesus' followers. Some of them, you remember, even had their mothers trying to lobby Jesus for them. (laughs) And anyone in education knows not not a lot has changed. Indeed, with this in mind, I invite you to come with me for just a moment to the 22nd chapter of the same gospel. For I think what we read there can shed even more light on what we are trying to say with regard to our focal passage in Luke 17. In in chapter 22, Luke gives us his account of what we are observing today, the institution of the Lord's Supper. 
And Luke is the only gospel writer who informs us that as the disciples were sitting about the table that holy night, that a dispute, an argument, arose amongst them concerning which of them should be considered the preeminent disciple, the greatest. I am reading from verse 25 of Luke 22. And Jesus said to them, he is responding to their argument, the kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and those who exercise authority over them are called benefactors, but not so among you. On the contrary, he who is greatest among you, let him be as the younger, and he who governs as he who serves. For who is greater, he means in this world, who is greater, he who sits at the table or he who serves? Is it not he who sits at the table? Yet, yet, I am among you as the one who serves. Oh, my friends, behold, the wonderful paradox of the gospel. In this world, the master commands and the servant obeys. The master sits down at table and the servant serves him. That is the way it works in this world. That's the rule. But in the kingdom of God, that's turned on its head. In the kingdom of God, the servants sit at table and the master serves them. As amazing as that is. Which brings me to a second lesson I want us to learn this morning. The life and death of our blessed Lord shows that there is a higher duty than mere obedience to the letter of the law. In the kingdom of God, what is valued, what is prized, what is rewarded, even above the virtue of faith, is the virtue of love. Not the emotion of love, but love defined this way, the seeking of the good of the other first. That's what love is. The seeking of the good of the other. In the kingdom of God, what is rewarded is the attitude that sees others as more important than oneself. In the kingdom of God, those who are rewarded are those who faithfully obey, to be sure, but who obey not out of compulsion or even a sense of duty alone, and certainly not out of a desire to curry favor with God or to prove oneself as more virtuous or spiritual than others. No, no. It is those who keep Christ's commandments out of love for Jesus and for their fellow disciples who are rewarded. It is those who joyfully make themselves last, consider themselves last, who are considered first in the kingdom of God. Jesus, of course, modeled this throughout his ministry, didn't he? But especially so. In his institution of the sacrament of the Lord's Supper, which we are celebrating in concert with Christians around the world today. That night, the master washed his disciples' feet, didn't he? That night, he served them supper, didn't he? And then he got up from the table and went to the cross for them and died for them. The master of the universe, as St. Paul put it, emptied himself of everything but love in order to serve his slaves. And that's what he calls his apostles and disciples to do in his name. That's what he calls us to do. This is my commandment, he said, that you love one another. So with that in mind, look back now to Luke 17. As we have seen, Jesus commanded his disciples, if your brother sins against you, rebuke him. If he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in a day and seven times in a day returns to you saying, I repent, you shall forgive him. And the disciples responded, oh Lord, if that's the requirement, then increase our faith. <laughs> We're going to need it. To which I'm sure all of us would say, amen. We have a hard time forgiving anyone anything. 
And if they do the same thing twice, we say, well, they've got, they deserve what they've got coming. <laughs> Different standard. Jesus said, you already have faith sufficient to keep this commandment. You already have it. What you lack is the proper motivation. What you lack is the proper attitude. What you lack is love. You find it hard to forgive your brother. You find it daunting to go on forgiving him. Not because you don't have faith in me, but because you don't love your brother as much as you love yourself. That's the problem. Not insufficient faith. <laughs> insufficient love. After all, the law, Jesus said, is summed up in these two requirements. You remember them. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love is a higher duty in the kingdom of God. It's a higher duty even than faith. To be sure, without faith, it is impossible to please God. But if our faith is not rooted in love, it is worthless. It is unprofitable. We can be the most orthodox people in the world. We can know our theology backwards and forwards. We can quote Matthew Henry till we're blue in the face. Or John Calvin. Or John Wesley. Or name your favorite author. But if we don't do so with love, it's a sham. That is why Jesus responded to a request for an increase of faith in the curious manner he did. He wanted his disciples to understand that if you have the faith the size of a mustard seed, and you do, obviously, since you're not asking for faith but an increase of faith, if you have the tiniest amount of faith, you can say to a mulberry tree, which must have been standing nearby, be pulled up by the roots, plant yourself in the sea, and it would obey you. Matthew records, you remember, that on another occasion, Jesus told these same disciples, if you have Faith the size of a grain of mustard seed, you will say to a mountain, move from here to there. And it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. That's the power of even a modicum of faith. But notwithstanding that, the warning is this. Don't get caught up on faith in and of itself. Not in isolation from the higher duty of the Christian. For in the kingdom of God, as St. Paul warned, if you have all faith so as to remove mountains, thinking of that parable, but have not what? Love. You are nothing. You are an unprofitable servant. Faith, my friends, is a cardinal virtue in the kingdom. What did St. Paul say? Faith, hope, and love. These three abide. But never forget, never forget, the greatest of these is love. The highest duty, the highest calling of the follower of Jesus of Nazareth is faith expressing itself through love for God and others. And on this World Communion Sunday, let us pray that God in His grace might grant us that kind of loving faith for the world. Amen. Thank you for listening to this sermon from the pulpit of Christ Congregational Church of Lufkin, Texas. If you are listening to this sermon on CD, we invite you to learn more about Christchurch at ChristchurchLufkin.com. Until next week, may the peace of Christ be with you all.